Hey everyone, welcome to the Calvary Online Service. I'm Grace, one of the interns at the church. And I'm Faith, one of the other children's interns. Thank you guys for joining us, whether it's your first time or you've been with us for a while. Um, today we're going to be continuing in our Act, Love, and Walk series on justice, and Peter is going to be teaching from the book of Habakkuk. Um, but to start our service off, we're just going to pray together. Um, dear God, thank you for today and this opportunity that we have to meet online together. Um, God, I thank you for all the hands and work that went into putting this service together for us today. Um, God, I pray that you would be with Peter as he's teaching, that you would just bless his message and that you would speak through him. God, I pray that, um, yeah, our service would meet a, meet a lot of people um, and that it would resonate with all of us and that you would just work through the service we have for this morning. Um, yeah, maybe learn from it and glorify you in everything we do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alicia and I am one of the worship leaders here at Calvary. It is wonderful to be worshiping together today on Calvary's online service. This morning's call to worship is found in Psalm 69 verses 29 to 34 and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who see God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. In this psalm, we see God hears the prayers of the needy and that even if we are going through afflictions or pain, God is our salvation and we are called to praise his name with song. I know that there are times when we might not feel like singing praises to God amidst our struggles, but the psalmist explains that when we humbly seek God and sing praises, this is very pleasing to him. He desires our praise, whether we are in the highs of life or the lows. As we sing this first song together this morning, we can think about the psalmist and choose to praise God in all our circumstances. That even if we are in our lowest valley or our hearts are heavy, we can still choose to bless the Lord's name and sing for joy. Please join us now in singing, Yes I Will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. Nothing can stand against the 
At this point in the online service, I'm just going to ask if you can pause the video and just take some time to read through all of Habakkuk chapter 2 before you continue. Also, if you could pray uh, just for this next coming week, we have our serve camp coming up and we would love to have be covered in prayer for that week. So if you could take that time and then unpause the video again. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Lambert. I'm one of the student ministry interns here at Calvary and I'm going to be teaching this morning. Have any of you ever been left hanging by someone? Uh, for me, I have this, this story I want to share. And my, See, my family lives in Cambridge, uh, and I, I go to school there. Uh, and one morning, I had class, but because we share a car, I had to wait. My, my dad and my sister were running errands in Guelph. It's about a 20-minute drive. Um, but we had talked the night before, and they assured me that they could get back in time, and I agreed with them. So... Things went well that morning, but as time ticked on, they weren't there. Um, and I started thinking all these things like, where are they? They should be back by now. I hope nothing's happened. Uh, but I shoved those out of my mind, and I remained convinced that they were going to be back in just a minute or two. And I stayed like that, thinking that, at the door with my jacket on my backpack for about 20 minutes. Um, and finally, 10 minutes before my class was about to start, I finally picked up the phone and I called my sister and I just said, hey, what happened? I thought I was supposed to get a ride you know, to school today. Uh, fortunately, nothing had happened to them. Uh, they had just forgotten that I needed the car and they were enjoying a nice breakfast at Cora's. <laughs> uh, this meant, of course, that they were still in Guelph and I still had 20 to 30 minutes to wait for them to get home. Uh, as you can imagine, I was late for my class. My point in telling that uh, it's just to highlight the fact that uh, sometimes people don't always follow through on their assurances to us. You know, sometimes, like in my story, that's just a genuine mistake. It's just a genuine mistake. But other times, particularly when it's intentional, we call that betrayal. Um, and one of the biggest betrayals out there uh, occurs when you know governments and institutions and just our society fails to take care of everyone. You know, it, it fails to take care of all the citizens of that society equally. This is something that's called systemic injustice, uh, where the system that's in place currently uh, allows for certain citizens to be mistreated or exploited in some way or form. Uh, an example of this is probably something that many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's the fact that Canada is one of the few countries in the world with absolutely no legislation concerning abortion. Uh, a person or a woman can go and have an abortion for any reason whatsoever at any time in the pregnancy. Um, and this is just a, a horrible injustice toward to the unborn because the unborn children have no protections whatsoever up until the point of birth in Canada. Um, another one, which is not as well known and a little bit harder to talk about is the fact that virtually every country in the world suffers from a human trafficking problem. Just this past year, a sex trafficking 
ring was broken up in Ontario, and it was being run by three teenagers between the ages of 17 and 19. And, you know, they were setting up young girls in hotels in cities along the 401, and, yeah, getting clients to be visiting them. Um, one of those hotels was actually really close to where I go to school, and I, it was pretty shocking to find that out. Thankfully, uh, the police caught them not too long into the, this operation. But there are lots of people out there that don't get caught. Um, someone like Jeff Epstein was a millionaire in the States. Uh, he went decades and decades before getting caught because of who his friends were. Uh, you know, he was recruiting girls from an early age and basically grooming them for a job where, yeah, they were taken advantage of and they couldn't say anything without being in danger of losing their job or having smear campaigns, all these different things against them. Um, and because Jeff Epstein made a habit of having rich and powerful friends around him, it just the investigation stalled for a long time. There were even lawyers who were fighting to not have his case go to court because they knew him. These people were more concerned about protecting their public images than they were about the women who were in Epstein's employment, right, who were being hurt by him and being hurt by others in his circle. And the big question that I think we all should be asking, and probably are when we get confronted with things like this, is what is God doing about this? Is he doing anything about it? Like, how, how can't he be doing something about this? Because, you know, God is described throughout the Bible as a just God. He doesn't allow injustices to go on. Uh, the Apostle Paul, even uh, in the Romans, he says that all the law is summed up in the command to love your neighbor as yourself. For love does no wrong to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. The biblical understanding of justice is rooted in this idea of love. Because if everyone takes care of the people around them, no one's left behind. Everyone gets cared for. But un unfortunately, we live in a world where that just doesn't happen. Not enough, anyways. So where is God's justice in this often unloving and unjust world that we live in? Now, to answer that question, we're going to be looking to the book of Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk, like I did, when I called my sister, he had a similar conversation, but with God. And he asked him just, you know, what exactly was going on in the world around him. Now, to understand his situation, we need to look at the past 30 to 40 years before the book was written. Uh, and we'll start by talking about a, a guy named Josiah. Josiah was the last righteous king of Judah, sorry, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, Israel, had been destroyed by the Assyrians a long time ago, and so Judah, with the capital of Jerusalem, was all that was left. Um, there had been several generations of wicked kings in Judah uh, before Josiah, and they had led the people into worshiping idols and doing all horrible kinds of horrible things. Um, they allowed the rich and the powerful to take advantage of the poor um, and the vulnerable, those that had no one to take care of themselves. Um, and they were rigging the juries and the courts and everything in their favor, all these terrible things. Um, and that all changed during Josiah's reign because one guy was in the temple and he discovered Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, and the law that Moses had written for them. Things had been so bad beforehand that no one even remembered what the Bible said. Um, but once it was read out loud, it changed Josiah's heart and it sparked a revival in the kingdom. Unfortunately, there was a few areas that Josiah failed in. Uh, the first one was international politics. So the world was kind of going crazy around him. Uh, the Babylonians took out the previous superpower in the world, which is the Assyrians. And the Egyptians, who had been fighting the Assyrians, teamed up with them now to fight the Babylonians. And Josiah, who's in the middle of all of this mess that's going on around him, decides... I'm going to back Babylon. So he marched his army out and he tried to stop the Egyptians from coming to the aid of the Assyrians. 
and he lost. Uh, he actually died in the battle. His army was scattered. Um, and, and the sad thing is, is that the Egyptians wouldn't have made it in time anyways. Babylon finished off the Assyrians, and the Egyptians had to turn tail and run back home. And the second, and probably the most important thing, was that Josiah failed to pass his faith on to the next generation. Whether it was his fault as a father or his sons just refused to listen, uh, no one after Josiah followed the Lord, and instead they lived more like the previous kings who had been so evil. His son Jehoahaz replaced him as king, but the Egyptians came and captured him about three months later, and they replaced him with his brother, Jehoiakim. Uh, these are fun names. <laughs> Jehoiakim, he ruled about 11 years, uh, and he ruled as basically a sub-king to the Egyptians, and later on to the Babylonians. And most biblical scholars believe that it was in that 11-year reign before Babylon took over that Habakkuk is writing from. And so we get this picture of the nation of Judah getting something good going under Josiah, actually turning things around, and possibly even being able to live as a righteous nation, righteous nation as God wanted them to. Unfortunately, that all went downhill when Josiah died. And now, at the time of uh, Habakkuk, when he's writing this, when he's having this conversation with God, the people are, they fall in their king's example. Right? The, the wicked outnumber the righteous. The righteous feel abandoned by God because they're outnumbered and they're overwhelmed. And the wicked are basically getting around all the law and they're winning. It feels like they're winning. Justice is being twisted to suit the rich and the powerful and being withheld from the poor and the marginalized. And so Habakkuk comes before God and he asks, God, the corrupt and the wicked are running our nation into the ground. Where are you? And God responds by saying, I'm doing something in the world around you that you wouldn't believe even if I told you. I am giving power to Babylon to deal out their idea of justice on Judah. Babylon, those, those frightening people who worship their own strength and think that they're invincible. Now, Habakkuk can accept God's judgment on Judah and his people. That's what he wanted, after all. He wanted God to correct them, to get after them, punish them until they turned back to God. But Babylon is way more wicked than Judah ever was. And they have a tendency to destroy everything in their path. And so Habakkuk is actually even more upset. It's like God's idea of justice sounds horrible to him. And he asks, God, how can you use such a wicked people as the Babylonians to do your will? Like how, how can you allow that? How, how can you even stand to be, have them in your presence? They, they don't care about human life. Right? They're like a fisherman who draws in hundreds of fish a day. He doesn't care about any individual one of them. The Babylonians, they delight in their ability to destroy and conquer other peoples. They worship that ability even because it makes them rich. And he asks, will they be allowed to go on like that forever? At this point, God makes himself extremely clear. He says, let everyone know that my judgment is coming on Babylon. Wait for it. It will come soon. Even if it looks like it's not, wait for it. I will bring about justice at the right time, and I will not delay. God assures Habakkuk that the nation of Bitmat sorry, the nation of Babylon will be punished for the wickedness that has been rotting in the world around them and will pour out on Israel and Judah. He assures them that the tables will soon be turned and everything that the nation of Babylon has done to people and will do to people, it will in turn be done to them as well. Now Habakkuk knows what God is capable of. Uh, he knows what the things that he's done to the wicked in the past, and it, it terrifies him, and rightly so. He goes into this long description of what it will look like when God comes to destroy the wicked, and it, it makes the Babylonians look like nothing. It looks like, like a chihuahua when you're faced with a wolf, right? 
The Babylonians have nothing on God. Uh, and yet, as scared as Habakkuk is, he finds comfort and courage in God's character. You see, God chose the Israelites to be his people, not because they were amazing or righteous or super strong, but just because he loved them. You know, and in that light, in light of that love, he will punish, but he will also rescue them and he will always come back to them. That's just who he is. He punishes, but he also forgives. Therefore, Habakkuk declares that he will wait quietly for justice to come on his oppressors. Now, when he says wait quietly, he doesn't mean he's just going to sit there and do nothing. He's a prophet. Uh, and a prophet's job is to proclaim God's word to the people, to call them back to living righteously. And you don't do that by saying nothing. You have to talk publicly. You have to try and convince people. You have to speak God's word. Uh, but what he's saying here is that when he's done all that he can do and things still feel out of control, he can rest in the knowledge that it's not out of control. It's actually under control. And God's the one that has it under control. And this is really important that he knows this because things will spiral out of control completely in the years to come. You know, the, the kings of Judah will just keep rebelling against Babylon and keep losing. They'll keep getting captured and taken into exile with lots of their people. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, just levels Jerusalem. He just tears it down brick from brick. The temple is destroyed. Every building is destroyed. And only a few people are left alive to tend the farms around where Jerusalem used to be. To be. It's a, a terrible future is waiting for the people of Judah. And we have no idea whether Habakkuk survives that or not. At the very least, even if he did survive and was taken to Babylon, it's not very likely that he would have lived to see his people return 50 years later. And yet Habakkuk, he ends the conversation with God by rejoicing over him. Now, even when it seems like the whole world is going careening towards a cliff at 100 kilometers an hour, Habakkuk declares that he can rejoice in God. He can re rejoice in the goodness of the God of his salvation. So what's the point of all this? What's the, what's the purpose of the book of Habakkuk? Well, for Habakkuk, the purpose of it for him and his people, the fellow people who still believed in God in Jerusalem, it was reassurance. God was saying, I will set things right. It's going to, it might seem like it's getting worse, but I'm in control. Trust me. But what about us today? Well, it's reassurance as well. Right? We still live in a world where there's sin and there's pain and there's hurt. And we can trust that God has that under control, even if it looks like everything's spiraling out of control. But for us today, it also serves as a bit of a warning. Um, and before I go into that any further, I'm I've got to explain that there's some differences between Habakkuk's, Habakkuk's situation and ours. I'm just going to highlight a few of them that I think are important. First of all, it, we're in a different country with different politics. Right? We're, not, uh, we're not the nation of God as Israel was. Right? We, we live in a secular nation with a secular government. And, and it just happens that some of God's people live here. And also, we're not dead center in one of the most contested areas of the world, right? We're not in a war zone. Uh, there aren't great nations on either side of us fighting and warring over world dominance, but we're just not in that situation. We're in a, a more peaceful area of the world, a more peaceful, we have a more peaceful situation. Um, and we're also under a different covenant, right? The, the Old Testament covenant, which Habakkuk lived under, that was between God and a nation. Uh, it involved national security and material blessing. Whereas the new covenant that we have with God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is with individuals. It's between God and individuals. And these individuals make up the body of Christ, which is the church, which is us. Uh, it involves eternal security and spiritual blessing. So our, our place in heaven with Jesus forever is guaranteed but our material blessing here on earth and our safety is not. And probably most importantly is there's a difference of 
life experience here. Uh, the majority of our community here at Calvary belongs to a demographic that really has never experienced any kind of systemic injustice before. Um, and that's, that's not to accuse us of anything, it's just reality, right? The things that Habakkuk and the other believers in ancient Jerusalem are going through, it's completely different. It's completely different. Um, and we need to keep that in mind as we look at what this means for us now. For those of us today that, you know, who may be watching um, and who have been the victims of systemic injustice, um, I just want to say I may never experience what you have. Uh, I may never understand what you are going through, but I want you to know that there's a place for you here at Calvary. See, God loves you, and he, he even made you in his image, just that he made us in his image. He made me in his image. He, he made everyone in his image. Uh, and he sent his own son, Jesus, to take the punishment for you and for me. You know, he died and he rose again to life, defeating death, so that we could live with him forever if we believe in him. He did that for everyone equally. Uh, so I just, we just want you to know that we love you and we are here to listen and support you in whatever way we can. Now, for those of us who aren't personally facing systemic injustice, I'm, I'm not downplaying our experiences. I'm not saying, oh, you know, you have nothing to complain about. We still wrestle with the unfairness of the world, right? We still wrestle with how we should respond to a world full of sin and corruption and overwhelming hurt. You know, we lose loved ones before they should be gone. Uh, we struggle with illnesses and conditions. You know, we get hurt by those we thought were close to us. And the main, main takeaway that we can get from Habakkuk is that we can know that even when it seems like God isn't doing anything, he's still at work. His justice is coming, even if we just can't see it yet. You know, justice may not come in the way or the form that we were expecting or the way that we were wanting, but it will come. Ultimately, even if we don't see justice in our lives today, Jesus is coming back for us someday soon, and he will set everything right again in the whole world. In the meantime, though, how are we to live? How are we to live while we wait for God? The answer for that actually comes from Habakkuk in chapter 2, verse 4, where he says, Behold, his soul is puffed up, speaking about the Babylonians. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. You see, Babylon was, he was puffed up of pride. He loved his own greatness. Uh, he was driven by greed. He was made bold by the prosperity, the fact that he got away with whatever he did. But God contrasts that with the people who love him and says, you will live by your faith in me. But what does living by faith look like? Well, first of all, God actually describes what it's not uh, when he goes through a couple of things that are called the five woes. It's a series of judgments that are placed on five different types of people. Um, I'm just going to read where they are in, in chapter 2. First one is, Woe to him who, weep, who heaps up what is not his own. So, basically, people who get rich at the expense of others, from stealing from others or cheating people out of things, um, twisting the law to benefit them in court battles or custody battles, things like that. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. So there's judgment on people who, they make themselves secure. They make sure that they have financial security or physical safety at the expense of others. Um, if it means they have to hurt someone or steal from someone or arrest someone or do whatever they have to do in order to make themselves safe, they'll do it. In verse 12, we have, Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city of iniquity. So God pronounces judgment on anyone who would try and start something or try and get a project done or found a business or found a country or any of these things at the expense of other people, at the expense of justice, by denying justice to people. 
In verse 15, he says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and you make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. So what's happening here is that there's imagery in the Old Testament where when you cause people to drink of your wrath, you're basically overwhelming them and doing whatever you want to them. Uh, mistreating them uh, often means torturing them. Uh, any way that you can really dishonor a nation and break down their pride and make them completely destitute with broken spirits, do it. Um, and nakedness is usually a euphemism for shame, to make them ashamed to be alive even, to be themselves. So God is pronouncing judgment here on those who use their power and authority to build themselves up at the expense of others by disgracing them, dishonoring them, uh, embarrassing them, uh, destroying their livelihood, things like that. And the fifth one is, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, or to a silent stone, arise. So here God is pronouncing judgment on those who worship idols, who worship anything other than him. And the interesting thing is, these first four, they're all about people who do something at the expense of others. Whereas the last one is about idolatry. And what's happening here is the first four are actually the same as the fifth. Because those who practice injustice are idolaters. They're putting themselves and personal gain above taking care of others. And in, in that light, all injustice is actually idolatry. And this is where the warning comes into play. This is where the warning comes into play because injustice can be hard to spot when it makes my life easier. Especially if I don't take any kind of active role in the injustice. But what if, what if injustice in our society is allowed to keep on going for so long because the average person like me actually benefits from it in some way? Because the average Babylonian wasn't involved in conquest or killing or pillaging or anything like that. Um, but they would have benefited from it. They would have benefited from all the treasure and cheap labor in the form of captives and slaves and vacant farmland that became available every single time their country conquered someone else. In this case, they're their own idol. We're our own idol because we justify what's happening elsewhere because our situation is bettered by it. Every time I find a way to get ahead, of, ahead in life at the expense of someone else, I'm actually sacrificing on the altar of me. And I, I took us some time I took some time to make a list of how I personally benefit from ongoing injustice, injustices in our society and past ones. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that this is not meant to offend anyone or accuse anyone. Uh, these are just facts that I've uncovered from doing my own research. So there are people who are claiming things, but this isn't injustice, this is injustice, and I looked into it because I'd never heard about it before. And it shook me up a lot. So I'm just going to read a few of them to you. Uh, one of them is, I live in one of the most prosperous countries in the world, uh, and it's Canada. Canada is like that, though, because our founding fathers built it with land and resources that they had stolen or swindled from its indigenous peoples. Yeah, we made treaties with them and agreements, but our prime ministers historically have been very, very bad at following through on their end of treaties. Um, oftentimes, we would make a treaty, not follow through with it, and when an indigenous group came to them and said, why, why aren't you keeping your promise to us? We would brand them as troublemakers and rebels and tell them to get lost. Um, we got the second largest land mass uh, land area in the world where many of them still have no access to clean water. It's not a good trade. Um, but I benefit from that because I've inherited it. 
inherited it. Um, the other one is, I have never actually been pulled over by the police while driving. Um, mostly that's because I'm a good driver. I was taught well. Um, but part of that's also because statistically, if you look at who gets pulled over the most, me and my demographic is not who's being looked for. Um, and I say that with utmost respect to our police officers. I, I'm not accusing them of anything. I'm just saying that if you look at the statistics, that's true. I don't even know where the insurance in my car is. <laughs> I don't know what it looks like. I'm assuming it's in the glove compartment. But if I ever got pulled over, I would be scrabbling through that thing trying to figure out which one is which because I've never even had to think about that before. Whereas my neighbor gets pulled over all the time because he fits a description. I benefit from that. Statistically, I have a better chance of getting a call back on an application I put in for a job because of my name. People with last names that are more European sounding are much more likely to get a call back or an interview than someone of an African American ancestry or a Latino ancestry. Um, the research proves that. And so there are more jobs available for me. I benefit from that. I've never been in a situation where someone called the cops on me because I was being too loud at night with friends in a public area. Um, I've never had to worry about walking across a dark parking lot at night wondering who might attack me because I'm not the generic target. I'm not. I, I mean, a lot of these things I can't do anything about. I, I, I'm not saying that I'm responsible for these things or responsible for the actions of others. We're all responsible for our own actions, right? all of us. It doesn't matter what's happened in, to us in our past. But I, I can't just sweep injustices under the rug and go about my day as if everything's normal. People are still being harmed by it, even if I don't see it. So, so what can we do? Well, I have three things that we can talk about. Um, when we're hearing about perceived injustices, just hearing about them, okay? If someone is saying, I have been denied justice, first of all, we need to search for the truth. Um, our society tends to polarize into two camps and we will say everything in the other camp says is totally false. We won't believe it whatsoever. And we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow ourselves to get sucked into that. What we need to do instead is we need to take a step back and we need to ask, what is actually happening here? Can I find the answers? Where is the relevant information? Uh, what does biblical justice look like in this situation? What would it have to change in order for everyone to take care of their neighbors out of love in this situation? I guarantee you, it's the answer to that last question will not fit perfectly with either camp. It just won't. There will be things in either camp that aren't biblical because we're human and we're sinful and that invades everything that we try to do. But even though there'll probably be one side that's more on the right than the other, there will be probably be good points made by both sides. And so we need to listen to both, and we need to try to find a good solution that draws us together, not tears us apart. Because biblical justice is not equal to winning an argument. Biblical justice is equal to making sure that no one gets left behind by society, and that those who are harming others are stopped. Because even the people that we disagree with are our neighbors. And if they're our neighbors, we need to care for them, just as God cares for us. Second thing that we can do, we can search our hearts. Once we've got you know, an idea of what's going on, we're trying to find answers to what is the biblical solution to this, we need to search our hearts. So our society is extremely good at you know, condemn injustice, condemn wrongdoing, and then go about as if it's business as usual and not change anything. We can't fall into that trap. Instead, we have to take another step back and ask, am I becoming callous 
um, and cold towards people who are suffering in this way, these specific people or these specific people or, or whatever. Um, and then we have to ask, am I benefiting from the status quo right now? Am, am I benefiting from the fact that other people are being mistreated, even if it's in unintentionally, especially if it's unintentionally? We ask, do I need to repent and ask God's forgiveness? Do I need to make changes in my life in order to love all of my neighbors equally and properly as justice requires? And finally, we can speak out. See, as a prophet, I talked about this earlier, uh, Habakkuk's job was to call people back to God. And he didn't do that by sitting around and hoping for the best or just praying about it and nothing else, though he did pray. What he did is that he went out there and he spoke to people. He talked to crowds. He talked to individuals. He talked to the people in his life. He talked to people who were their political and religious leaders and pointed out all of the injustice that was going on to them. And he spoke out about it even though it probably didn't make him very popular. Someone that lived around the same time as him and was in ministry at the same time as him was the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he spoke out about injustice and sin and it brought him a lot of pain. Uh, you know, he got labeled a rebel, he got labeled a traitor, he got labeled someone who was against the kingdom, against the nation, and he got imprisoned a couple times. One time he was thrown down a well and left there for the night to wait execution in the morning. Right? Speaking out is not popular, but it's necessary. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to speak out against ungodliness in the world, including injustice. But we're not meant to do that on our own strength, as if we were responsible to change the world by ourselves, because we're not. We are called to do what we can and when we can, and call people to do, live differently, and then we leave the rest up to God. Because if we try to do this on our own strength, we will get frustrated we will become overcome with anger, we will fall into bitterness, and we will sin. I know this because it happened to me a few weeks ago. I was aggressive and I was rude to a number of my friends um, as we were having a discussion about systemic injustice, uh, systemic racism specifically in the States. Um, and I said some awful things to one of my friends. I really attacked his character because I was just frustrated with him. And I just wanted I just wanted him to understand where I was coming from. And so I thought if I, I shocked him into it and let some of my rage out, my anger out, he would understand. But that's not what happened. I, fortunately, you know, God, we serve a God who's merciful and forgiving. Um, and he's given me friends who are the same. And, and that friend did forgive me, um, fortunately. And I'm very thankful for that. And it was strange that in one afternoon, I understood both why there are lots of people protesting and rioting in places in the States, and why the people on the other side that completely write them off and won't listen to anything they say. Because on one hand, injustice is rage-inducing. Watching other people be mistreated for no reason angers me, it angers everyone. It's a natural human response. But rage doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't bring about biblical justice. All it does is it drives people away. It divides us. And it makes it easy to discredit anything you stand for. As one of my heroes, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Because biblical justice is founded on loving our neighbors. And we'll never be able to love them enough unless we're resting in God's love and recognizing that it's his work and we're just joining him in it. So finally, I just want you guys to know, like, don't lose heart, right? Don't lose heart in all of this. Pray that God would help you to search for the truth, search your hearts, speak out. Um, speak out for those who can't speak out themselves or are not listened to. Um, and realize that God is working in the world around us in ways that we would never know or never think possible and never believe even if we were told. I,
on that note, I'm just going to pray. And I'm going to thank you all for listening. Father God, I just want to pray for anyone who might be tuning in and listening today uh, who is struggling with either being the victim of pers- the personal victim of injustice, regardless of what kind, um, or is just someone who's seen it in the world and is frustrated and, and discouraged. I pray that you would comfort our hearts. I pray that you would love on us and surround us with godly men and women who are going to love on us and listen to our pain and listen to our brokenness um, and hold us tight just as you do. Um, I pray that you would change our hearts so that we recognize the ways that we benefit from the mistreatment of others and you would convict us of that and not allow us to just go back to the business as usual, but that we would change and in changing ourselves that we would change our communities as well. I pray for the day, Lord Jesus, that true justice, true justice of every neighbor taking care of those around him, where no one's left behind and no one's allowed to be hurt anymore. I pray that that day would come soon. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Hey Calvary, Pastor Josh coming to you from the gym. The gym has been pretty quiet the last little while, but this past week, Jordan Kirk spent one day, one whole day measuring and laying out chairs and, and setting things out so that when we return to church on Labor Day weekend, we will be properly socially distanced and be in compliance with the things that have been handed down by the health unit. As you can see, we have 100 chairs that we've set out, and we can probably squeeze a couple more in here and there if we had to make adjustments for families. But we're gonna be able to uh, host 100 people when we get back in the fall, and we're gonna need some help to do that. We're gonna have opportunities to serve in ways that we haven't had before pre-COVID. For instance, we're gonna need sanitation teams. We'll need folks who don't mind wiping down the surfaces, the door handles, the doorknobs, uh, light switches, you know, those things that we've touched after the service and before with, uh, with wipes. We'll need people to work in attendance so that we have a tracking mechanism so that we know who is here. We'll need folks to direct others into their seats and help move traffic along, move the flow of people in and out of the building. So we're gonna have a lot of opportunities to serve and if you'd like to help out, I would love to hear from you. You can email josh at calvaryguelph.com and I'm just gonna start creating a list of folks who are willing to help out with some of our COVID requirements as we're getting ready to get back to church in the fall. Thanks, Calvary. Looking forward to seeing you. Have a great day. Bye for now. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week on our online service. Uh, just to close our service out, I just have a couple opportunities for ministry. The first one is, uh, we say this every week, but we just want to thank you so much for giving. Uh, we at Calvary are so blessed by your generosity. Uh, and if you want to continue uh, to con to give to our church, you can do so by going online. Uh, there's a giving tab at the uh, top of our main page that will uh, give you all the information you need to know about how you can continue to give uh, to continue to further the kingdom work that God is doing through us here at Calvary. And the second one, again, we say this every week as well, uh, but uh, Christina's interns actually, uh, Faith and Grace, have put together our kids video for this week. So if you are an elementary school age child, uh, we'd love for you to check that out. It is uh, in the email that you should have received this morning from Shannon. And as always, we do uh, close our service just by reading scripture. And so our sending scripture for this series is Micah uh, chapter six, verse eight. Would you read this with me? It says, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Would you go in peace uh, today to love and to serve the Lord?